Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I'm a ranger in the National Park Service. I was flipping through your posts while on lunch break and saw a few paranormal ones and missing four on one ones. I am very experienced and have seen many strange things in these parks. The things I cannot explain, I've yet to see anything deemed paranormal or even supernatural in my 20 years of experience. I have seen a number of strange things though, many of them I can't explain, but I always have to be careful of what I label them as, and specifically on paper, that they are natural occurrences if you understand what I'm saying. My husband is also a park ranger, and he has seen more than I have and has witnessed more things than he can explain. Currently, I'm on the East Coast and my husband is on the West. We have parks in common and we have parks that are different. I'm also kind of a park naturalist and have been in many places in the parks that most people have not gone to. The thing that struck me the most is that I could not explain was when I worked at Canyonlands NP. I was working at the island and the Sky Visitor Center. It was around the time when Canyonlands National Park was getting a lot of attention due to the status of Dark Sky Sanctuary. I had many people from the public come and ask me questions about how to see the night sky. One couple came in and spent quite some time talking about the stars and planets. The man of the couple, probably around 30 years of age, left for a moment to go to the bathroom. His girlfriend asked, Are we close to a Skinwalker Ranch? I was quite taken aback and replied, we are quite a distance away, probably over an hour's drive. They told me, that's a good thing because they are not what they say they are. I asked her, what are they? And she said they were stalking, manipulative, dangerous creatures, but she could not tell me much more. She acted very strange and very fidgety, almost like a drug addict would while they were feeding. It was very strange behavior, but I doubt she was on drugs because she was very coherent, and even though what she was saying was creepy, it wasn't exactly drug talk. We spoke for a few more minutes, then her boyfriend returned, and they left. I still wonder about that encounter and what she meant. It sounded like she knew something. I've often thought about it. I would love to know more about what she knew about them specifically, but I attribute that encounter to a different thing altogether. Again, I've been doing this job for well over 20 years, and while I've had some strange experiences like that, I've never exactly seen a ghost or some sort of demon before. In this email, I'll tell you about one more story that I have. So, this is around the same time I was working at night, and actually walking back to one of my vehicles, not my personal vehicle by the way, and maybe about 35 yards into the woods. I heard my name being called by a voice that sounded very familiar. I could not quite put my finger on who it was, but I knew the voice from somewhere. But they were very softly calling my name from in the woods. Immediately, this struck every wrong chord in my body because I knew that whoever this person was did not mean well, if you catch my drift. And how do they know my name? They were clearly stalking me. Something, everything about the situation was bad. I called out to them, showing my light and my gun, demanding they show themselves. I realized once I stopped talking just how quiet the night was. Even the crickets had ceased their noise making. I quickly backed my way to my vehicle and drove out of there. I don't know what that was or who that was, but I'm glad I did not find out. I'm not sure how to start this as I've never had to write this down, I've only ever spoken to my partner about it. I'll apologize in advance for the length of this, as it spans a few years. Most of my life I've seen things, whether it's shadows out the corner of my eye, or just as I'm drifting to sleep, or felt the presence of something I can't see. I've been grabbed, shoved and heard whispers. None of that compares to my frequent visitor for several years. Back in 2017, I was 23 years old. I had just broken up with a long-term girlfriend and was in a bit of a bad place mentally. I spent a lot of time alone and in my own head. This is when the problem started. I was at my workplace at the time, using the urinal. 
I felt like someone was watching me like a burning stare. I quickly glanced over my shoulder, and in the gap between the cubicle, I could swear for a brief moment I saw something. It appeared to be some sort of disheveled woman. Just as quickly as I saw it, it disappeared. I chalked this up to sleep deprivation, didn't really think anything of it, so I just cleaned myself up and got back to work. I wish this was the end of it. Throughout the next few weeks when I was by myself, I never really felt like I was by myself. That's when I caught her. I was sat at my computer one evening, and out the corner of my eye, I saw that same woman peering at me round the corner of the door. As much as I try to remember, I've never been able to recall her face. I remember dirty gray hair and somewhat pale skin. But that's it. I froze up. I don't know how long I sat there staring back at her, and I don't remember her leaving. This persisted for years. I saw her at home, I saw her at work, I even swore I saw her in public. She was never in full view, she was always peering round a corner, like she just wanted to observe what I was doing, but peering enough that she wanted me to know that she was there. This changed one fateful night in 2019. The night my mother fell unwell and had to be rushed to hospital. I woke up feeling that something was wrong. I couldn't put my finger on what was up. Suddenly I hear from the hall my mother's door burst open, and she's calling to me. She's passed out on her floor, semi-conscious and breathing heavily. After helping her up, I called an ambulance for her and sat with her. She asked me not to leave her as she felt in danger. I didn't leave her side until the paramedics arrived. Eventually they came, agreed that my mother needed to go to hospital, and I said I'll follow in my car. I ran back upstairs to get changed as I had just thrown on some comfy clothes, and that's when I saw her. I rounded the corner of my bedroom, and in full view on the other side of the room was this thing. It was stood in full view. I still cannot recall its face, just the gray hair and pale skin. I've never felt such dread. I kept my eyes locked on it as I grabbed clothes from my floor I was wearing the previous day and just backed out of the room while keeping my gaze locked on it. I was half expecting something like out of a horror movie for it to just start sprinting at me with its arms outstretched. But nothing. It just stayed where it was. Even when I was walking downstairs from where my room was in full view, it was still stood there. When I came back home, it was gone. I slept downstairs for weeks. From that point I still saw it peering around the corner a lot, but never in full view like before. I eventually moved out in 2021. Since then I've had no more experiences with either that thing peering around the corner or anything else. I have nightmares about it occasionally, but nothing else. It was June 1, 2015, at approximately 2.30 in the morning. I was sitting up in my bed after a girlfriend of mine had just left. The next thing I knew, a bright blue light was shining through my slider, and I was laying flat on my back completely paralyzed. I think I could move my eyes, but I'm not sure. Then there were three four to five foot tall beings at the end of my bed. Their faces seemed kind of blurry, or maybe it's my memory of it. The one in the middle was talking to me in my voice, but inside of my head. I was trying to scream or even just move, but I couldn't. I just remember it telling me that everything was going to be fine, they're not going to hurt me. I asked them what they wanted. They said they just had to run a few tests, and in the blink of an eye the other two beings were on both sides of me. The two of them put their two fingers underneath my lower back and my shoulder, and I lifted out of the bed as if weightless. Then they floated me towards the sliding door, and the flash of blue light took me out. After that, all I remember was a cold table and feeling very uncomfortable. Then, suddenly, I was back in my bed sitting up, and it was 4.30 in the morning. I have a strange circle scar on my arm and three small scars in the shape of the triangle on my groin. Since then, I have seen a bright orange fireball floating across the sky in my backyard, and I wake every night at 3.30 and can watch the clock change. If this is just a dream, it was the most traumatic dream I've ever had in my life, and I hope my kids don't have these dreams. I live in West Yarmouth, Massachusetts.
For the past month, I've been finding footprints all over my horse farm. I first found them behind my big garage, not far from my horse pasture. Now I've been finding them in my horse's pasture. The first time I found them in my horse's pasture, they were a little bigger than my foot, and my horse's tracks are with them. I believe the creature is chasing my horses. Yesterday I found footprints in my front pasture, and I saw a juvenile and big footprints. After I gave my yearling a bath, I saw all these footprints by our horse's water tub by the fence line in our yard. There were small and big prints where you can see toes and heel outlines. One was odd to me where it could look like a huge dog print. I don't know. It had toes prints. It has scared me so much I have purchased a security camera to get the creature on video. We have heard stories there in the area cryptids. One person that saw them said that their big black hairy creature, this person deer hunts from a tree stand five minutes from our house, and the other person saw them in their vehicle's headlights late at night on back roads. It was big hairy creature. They believe Bigfoot. It's not far from our property five minutes away, and when this person went coon hunting, they heard vocalization whooping and fled from the area after hearing this sound. I have heard weird noises in the night from inside my house and many times I hear weird sounds from my bedroom window. One night something was outside my bedroom window and scratching on the screen and trying to open my window. If I didn't bar my window it would have got in. Even when I changed rooms it followed me outside to the different bedroom and started scratching the window screens in that room. This encounter happened this year. I live in Newark, New Jersey, and like exploring old abandoned buildings and locations. Back in May 2023, I was at the old Essex County Jail, which has deteriorated beyond recognition. There are walls falling down and holes in the ceiling. The entire complex has been left in ruins. It's also a place where squatters and homeless people have moved in throughout the years, but they usually leave quickly. I've been wanting to go in there for a while, so I strapped on my GoPro and headed out one weekend. I plan to spend a full night in the jail. The locks on nearly all of the gates have been cut, and there are gaps in the fences, so it was easy to access. There is also a dirt road that leads into the place. I took my time walking along on the dirt road, then entering the buildings because I wanted to get some decent shots of the exterior. Once inside, I ventured all over the jailhouse. I soon understood why so many people were creeped out by the place. It was absolutely disgusting and putrid from the transients coming and going. I decided to make my way to the lookout tower, which was the most comfortable area I could find. I could see my car in case there was a problem, and I had a great view of the entire facility from there. Once it got dark, I got as cozy as I could in my sleeping bag. At around midnight, I was woken by a loud banging noise. I grabbed my lantern and adjusted the knob to make it brighter. Then I had a clear look at the cause of the racket. A huge figure with giant wings flung itself against the window of the lookout tower. The entire room shook and I heard the glass starting to crack again. It hurled itself at the window. The thing was terrifying. It had large red eyes that glowed in the light of my lantern. The body was black and covered in hair. The wings were bat-like and maybe 15 feet wide. It was massive. I was shocked by the sight. So I started to run down the stairs of the lookout tower to get away, but I stumbled and dropped my lantern. It crashed on the steps. I was in total darkness. The banging had stopped. Then I heard the thing take flight on its powerful wings and soon it was gone. I believe that the creature was a mix of a moth a bat, and a human. Seriously, I believe the light from the lantern attracted it. Since that night, I have talked to other urban explorers who have mentioned the Batman in Newark. I had never heard of it before, but apparently others have. Have you ever heard of this creature? As the sun cast long shadows across the Arizona landscape, I found myself in a remote forest, determined to make the most of my solo hunt for pheasants. The rustling leaves and chirping birds created a symphony of nature, 
and the anticipation of a successful hunt surged through me. The forest felt alive, vibrant, and full of potential. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the canopy grew denser, blocking out more and more of the sunlight. The air grew cooler, and the silence was almost overwhelming, save for the occasional snap of a twig beneath my boots. My heart pounded with a mix of excitement and trepidation. It was as if I had entered a different world, one untouched by time and human influence. I followed a narrow path that seemed to have been carved out by the passage of animals. The path twisted and turned, and at times I had to crouch beneath low-hanging branches. It was then that I noticed a peculiar movement ahead, caught by the corner of my eye. As I advanced cautiously, the sounds of nature were replaced by a strange, hushed stillness. My steps grew slower as I caught sight of the creatures in the distance. My eyes widened in both awe and confusion. There they were, two creatures unlike anything I had ever seen before. The larger one, about seven to eight feet tall, was covered in light beige hair. It stood with its back to me, reaching for a branch about 15 feet off the ground. Its movements were deliberate, almost human-like, and a sense of primal curiosity washed over me. The smaller creature, only about three feet tall, mirrored the larger one's appearance, covered in hair, with the exception of its hands, feet, and around its eyes. This one had a darker shade of beige hair, and it was bent over, struggling to pick up a stick and put it in its mouth. The sight was utterly surreal, like stumbling upon a page from a storybook that had been lost to time. The hair on both creatures was thick, their appearance wild and untamed, as if they had emerged from the heart of the forest itself. I squinted, trying to make out the details of their faces, but their features remained largely obscured. The large creature's body was robust and powerful, its form shrouded in a cloak of mystery. My hunting instincts kicked in, and I shouldered my rifle with a practiced ease. I aimed carefully, focusing on the larger creature's back. The trigger was pulled, and the shot echoed through the woods. I watched as the bullet streaked toward its target, only to miss by a hair's breadth. To my astonishment, neither creature flinched at the sound of the gunshot. They seemed to be in a world of their own, completely unaffected by my presence. As the creatures continued their activities, seemingly unfazed, my mind raced to make sense of the situation. What were these creatures? Were they a new species? Or perhaps some forgotten legend brought to life? Doubt and wonder clouded my thoughts, leaving me hesitant to take another shot. Eventually, the creatures melted back into the forest, disappearing as mysteriously as they had appeared. I stood there, my heart pounding in my chest, the echoes of my missed shot fading into the distance. The forest around me returned to its usual symphony, as if it had absorbed the creatures into its evergreen embrace. When I returned to my friends, they bombarded me with questions about my hunt. They were eager to hear about my experiences, the game I had encountered, and my shots fired. But I remained silent, lost in my thoughts. How could I explain what I had witnessed? How could I convey the profound sense of wonder and bewilderment that had washed over me in those quiet woods? Instead of sharing my story, I simply smiled, my mind a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. Some mysteries are best left untouched, nestled within the heart of the forest, waiting for those rare moments when the boundaries between reality and the unknown blur, leaving us forever questioning what lies beyond. When I was a kid, like I was 11 or 12, something like that, I was playing in the huge parking lot that was behind my house in North Chicago, Illinois. I had a baseball bat and I was pretending it was a sword. So I was in the parking lot, slashing around, pretending I was fighting bad guys. The parking lot was one huge parking lot, and then it had driveways going beside the building out to the main road. So I was fighting in it, and I got up to the fence that was on the side of one of the driveways, and I did a fancy little slash, and then I pretended I sheathed it on my back, and then I stood up and I looked down the driveway. I saw myself standing on the sidewalk, staring back at me. Of course, I was freaked out because I didn't know what was going on. At first, I thought it was someone who looked just like me, and he probably thought the same thing. 
And then he kind of did a jog down the sidewalk past the building where I couldn't see him anymore. So I ran up and looked around the corner and he was gone. I looked around the parking lot just in case he was looking for me, but I couldn't see him. So, creeped out, I decided to head home, and I told my father about this, and then he told me about doppelgangers. I was convinced I saw my own doppelganger. Two or three years later, I'm walking down the sidewalk toward home, and I look down the driveway and I see myself playing in this parking lot doing all the same slashes. I did like the fancy slash and sheathe it, and I was like, I remember this. I remember seeing myself in this position. So without even thinking about it, I dashed off to the front of the building and turned around and I waited for my younger self to come up the driveway. But my younger self never showed up. I looked down the driveway and I was not there. I walked home and I told my father about what I just saw and he laughed. I wonder if seeing a doppelganger is common. My father acted as if it was something that happens to everyone. I'm an adult now and it's been over a dozen years since that last encounter. I'm just wondering what caused me to see it. There's a story I've been wanting to tell for a while now that happened to me some years ago. Thinking back, it gives me the chills. For the sake of anonymity for those involved, I've changed our names, but the dates are accurate. For clarity's sake, I'm not a believer in the paranormal or the supernatural or any myths and legends. I'm still not sold on what happened, but it's creepy enough when I consider all the facts. I do apologize for the length, but I want to get all this out in one fell swoop. You see, my cousins live back in northern Wisconsin, the rural part, where houses are surrounded by miles of woods and the roads are dirt and gravel. Not that they're out in the boonies or anything. The main town, though small, is only about five miles down the highway from where they live. My uncle, let's call him Kurt. He's the local sheriff of the area and so has lots of interesting stories to tell. My cousins, having grown up in these woods, are expert hunters and fishermen. They've hunted at all hours of the day in all kinds of weather and have tracked anything from deer and pheasants to bears. What I'm trying to say is they don't scare easy. Neither do their hunting dogs, two black Labradors called Magic and DJ. I've never been easy to scare either, no has my brother, but what we experienced was enough to give us all the heebie-jeebies. Even ten years later, remembering these events is enough to give me chills. There had been strange occurrences over the years, none of which my brother nor I were aware of until we visited them one summer, back in 2006. Now my mom, my brother, and I usually visited them for at least a week or two every year up until Rob, who was three years older than my brother, left for college. We never experienced anything out of the ordinary until that year and haven't experienced anything since. What happened, though, has stayed with us all. My brother Mike and I weren't made aware of these happenings until we'd experienced enough to convince Uncle Kurt to share what he knew. Rob and Sam, who was one year older than me and a year younger than Mike, also chipped in with their own experiences. I'm chronicling our tales here in order as best as I can remember. 1998. Rob was about seven years old at this time. One night, he snuck into the backyard to play on the old swing set they had set up. My cousin's backyard is surrounded by an eight-foot-high chain-link fence to keep bears and other predators out and to keep the kids in. After swinging for a few minutes, Rob said he remembered hearing the most horrible noise he's ever heard, like something out of a horror movie. It was a distant roar, like some kind of huge beast, deep and brassy with an animalistic rumble, but at the same time screechy, like fingernails on a blackboard. Terrified, Rob fled back inside, screaming for his parents. They apparently had slept through the noise and had only awoken when they heard Rob scream. Approximately 2005, Kurt was finishing his patrol one night when he received a call from dispatch. Apparently, a local man had left his home early that morning to go fishing at one of the many lakes around town, promising his wife to be back around lunchtime. When he still hadn't returned by evening, his wife worriedly called the police. Once informed of which lake he'd gone to, 
Kurt and a couple squad cars headed to the narrow dirt trail that led off from the highway. It was a small turnoff, easy to miss if you didn't know it was there, surrounded on both sides by dense foliage and trees. It took maybe 10 minutes to get from the highway to the lake, as you had to drive very slowly on the dirt path to avoid potholes, branches, and occasionally animals that may be in the road. After a few minutes on the trail, the officers came upon the man's car, spun out from the trail and smashed against a tree several feet into the woods. The entire passenger side was caved in, as if something had rammed into the car at high speed and shoved it into the tree. There was blood and tufts of hair all over the inside of the car and the driver's seat belt was ripped out of the buckle and the windshield was completely gone. It was as if the man had been wrenched through the windshield and dragged away, but the police couldn't find any trail even after bringing in canines. The only evidence pointing towards an animal attack rather than a murder was a set of claw marks gouged into the metal hood of the car. Experts determined it must have been a very angry bear but no bears had been sighted, let alone reported, during that season. The man's body never turned up. August 9, 26. Sam and Mike, on the second night we were visiting, decided to try camping out in the backyard. Despite the fence, our aunt insisted they take at least one of the dogs into the tent with them just to be safe, so they took Magic, the older lad. Magic had been very well trained and was usually very quiet, but sometime in the middle of the night she became incredibly agitated. She began barking quietly at first, but soon much louder this is when Sam and Mike woke up. They told me that Magic would bark for several seconds, then fall quiet, not even growling, then start barking again. After repeating this several times, the two of them started hearing rustling from somewhere beyond the fence. They were camped somewhat near the house, so whatever was capable of making that much noise had to be huge. They stayed quiet, Sam warning Mike that if it was indeed a bear, any sudden movement may cause it to charge, and that fence wouldn't keep it out for long. However, despite Magic's ferocious barking, the rustling kept getting louder. Just as Sam was about to take the flashlight to try and see anything, our Aunt Kelly opened the side door and bellowed at Magic to shut up. Kelly, despite being a relatively frail woman, was incredibly loud and forceful, to the point that even Magic was somewhat scared of her. Apparently, whatever was in the woods was too, because the rustling soon faded and Magic fell quiet. Neither Sam nor Mike were able to fall asleep again, because a couple hours later, the rustling started again. Magic didn't make any more noise, but she stayed on high alert, standing stiff with her tail between her legs staring at the front of the tent. Sam said the rustling would die down occasionally, then start up from a different direction, as if whatever was out there was circling the house and trying to bait someone to come out. Around four in the morning, completely exhausted, Sam and Mike finally drifted off. When Kurt came outside around seven to wake them, he sounded. Strange, as Sam put it. When the two of them climbed out of the tent, they saw why. A section of the fence had been bent at the top, peeled outward as if something had grabbed it and tried to pull it down. Not even a bear would have been tall or brave enough to do this. Needless to say, they packed up the tent and slept inside for the rest of the visit. August 10, 2006 After the initial scare of the previous night had passed and Kurt spent the day patrolling the woods around the house for several hundred yards in all directions with both Magic and DJ, he determined whatever had visited the night before was gone. That evening, Mike and I were invited to paintball with Kurt, Sam, and Rob for a few hours. Being hunters, the three of them were very good at this, and Mike and I both had minimal experience. I declined, preferring to stay on the balcony and do some target practice with my other cousin Claire, who was two years younger than me. The four of them disappeared into the woods, and soon all we heard was the popping of the paintball guns and the occasional shout of joy or pain whenever one of them pegged another. Now I heard and saw nothing, but when Kelly cut the game short a couple hours later when she called for Kurt to help her clean up after DJ threw up all over the carpet, Mike went directly up to me and told me something that chilled me to the bone. At one point in the game, 
He'd been trying to circle behind Rob to peg him a good one when he saw movement out of the corner of his eye. Thinking it had been Sam or Kurt, Mike had crouched in a bush as the thing approached. As it got closer, he decided it was Kurt since the shape appeared to be very tall Kurt is six foot four, and took aim. However, as it continued to approach him, Mike noticed it appeared to be wearing something shaggy akin to a ghillie suit, and it took him a second to realize that none of them were wearing anything that resembled that. For those of you who don't know, ghillie suits are those shaggy camouflage uniform soldiers wear to disguise themselves among bushes. Unnerved, Mike was debating on whether to shoot at it or not when he heard Kelly calling. As Sam, Rob, and Kurt began making their noisy way back towards the house, the shape disappeared back into the darkness. He didn't bring this up with the others until we sat down and talked about all of this, and it seriously freaked out Rob, Sam, and Kurt since they hadn't seen or heard anything that night. August 11, 2006. Kurt decided to take us fishing at, you guessed it, the same lake. He was not superstitious in the least, and neither were any of us. So despite the creepy encounters over the past couple days, we were willing to chalk it up to wild animals and Mike and me not being used to the woods. So the six of us hitched up the boat trailer, piled into Kurt's truck, and headed out. The lake was maybe a 20-minute drive from the highway, not including the time it took to meander from the house to the highway and the highway to the lake. When we finally made it to the turnoff, Kurt drove very slowly as the rain from the past few weeks had made the path very treacherous and full of hidden bumps and ditches. Even going as slow as 10 miles per hour, the car bumped and jostled us enough to make our butts sore. Rob and Sam, ever the trackers, were leaning out of the side windows to try and spot any tracks in case they wanted to come back sometime later for hunting. They noted, but didn't mention until later, that all the tracks they saw seemed to be heading away from the lake. When we finally arrived, we split up. Rob, Sam, and Mike climbed into the smaller rowboat and headed off towards the other end of the lake. The lake itself was shaped like an uneven U, the main part being quite large with a smaller part disappearing around a bend and ending at a natural beaver dam. All in all, it takes maybe half an hour to row from one end to the other. While the boys were off doing their own thing, Kurt, Claire, and me jumped into the slightly larger motorboat and hung around the main section of the lake. Fishing was relatively good, as between the three of us over the course of several house, we managed to catch seven or eight decent-sized fish. Nothing strange had happened up until the sun was just starting to set, and we were casting our last few lines. At this time, I caught something truly massive on my line and attempted to reel it in with all I had. Being 12 at the time, I had very little arm strength, but I was determined to at least see what I'd caught. Kurt stepped in to help haul it up, thinking I'd either hooked a log or even a muskie which is like a freshwater barracuda, quite strong and with nasty needle teeth, Google it if you want, which were known to be in the lakes around the area. As a precaution in case this happened, all of our rods were strung with dragon line, made especially for fishing in musky territory as it was strong enough that they wouldn't snap the line while struggling on the hook. With Kurt's help, I managed to haul whatever was hooked almost to the surface. The lake water was relatively murky so visibility faded after the first foot or so, but even then the three of us saw something very, very big rising to the surface. At this point Kurt was convinced it was a musky, as the line was jerking back and forth and a log certainly wouldn't be able to do that. When the shape was maybe four feet from the surface, the line suddenly pulled so sharply I nearly lost my grip on my pole. The top foot of the pole dipped into the water almost straight down as the thing dove, and then before the rod had a chance to break or be ripped from my hands, the line snapped. That's right, it snapped. The ricochet was almost enough to send me over the other side of the boat but luckily Claire was there to catch me. Unnerved, but not wanting to end the day just yet, Kurt trimmed the line and gave me a new setup. The next thing that happened was soon after, when Kurt hooked a particularly large base on a five-hook lure. While attempting to remove the hooks, the fish was flopping so much that one of the stray hanging hooks caught Kurt's thumb and gave it a pretty nasty slice. 
Luckily, he packed first aid supplies in the tackle box for accidents just like this. But when he dripped antiseptic on the cut, he held his hand over the side of the boat, letting the blood dribble into the water. After a few minutes, Claire pointed out a trail of bubbles and ripples on the surface of the water some yards out. It circled our boat slowly a couple times, but soon disappeared. As the sun was now setting enough that Kurt decided to call it a day, he motored us back to the shore and we hitched up the boat to the trailer. While Kurt packed the fishing rods and strung the fish on a line to keep them from flopping out of the truck bed, Claire and I went back down to the shallows to look for frogs as we waited for the boys to return from the other side of the lake. Suddenly, we heard frantic shouting from the other side of the lake. Claire and I looked up to see the boys' boat quite literally skimming the water as they blew around the bend and gunning it straight for the shore. I remember thinking, since when did they have a motor on that boat? Because Rob was rowing so fast. Sam was shouting at us to get away from the water so they could land the boat, and moderately freaked out at their desperation, Claire and I promptly complied. In doing so, however, I tripped over an old campfire and ended up with a giant log pinning my foot down. Claire wasn't strong enough to lift the log, and by this time the boys' boat had reached the shore in record time. Now my brother wasn't exactly the strong type either, being only 14, but as soon as the boat hit the sand he leapt out and dragged it up the embankment single-handed, with Rob and Sam still sitting in it. Once the boat was entirely out of the water, Sam jumped out and managed to lift the log clear off my foot, while Rob helped Mike and Kurt hitch up their boat. I've honestly never seen any of them more frantic and unnerved, and it scared me. Even Kurt, who didn't fully understand their panic, got the message enough to book it out from the lake. Normally calm and collected, he took the trail much too fast and at several points we were afraid he'd break the hitch and we'd lose the boats. At this time the sun had fully set behind the tree line and it was unsettlingly dark inside the dense foliage. Rob kept turning to look behind us to make sure the boats were still hooked up but it wasn't until later that I realized he was also keeping an eye out for anything else. The rest of us were looking forward, trying to spot the highway, so Rob was the only one to attest to this, but he swears up and down that right as the trail opened onto the highway shoulder and we exited the woods, he saw a huge and hairy arm swing out towards the boat as if trying to grab the fish we'd left in the bottom with the tackle gear. He said it was thick and heavy like a bear's arm, but the elbow was all wrong, and it was much too long and high off the ground. He didn't mention this to any of us until several days later, when Mike and I were packing up to head back home. When questioned later as we prepared the fish for dinner, Sam explained that they'd been exploring the lake for a while. At the very end of the inlet was a huge beaver dam that had been there for quite some time, and they wanted to show Mike what it looked like. When they arrived, however, the dam was demolished. It looked like something very large and very strong had decided to use the logs as scratching posts. Weirded out, they decided to not get any closer and headed back towards the bend before dropping anchor. As the sun began to set and they were finishing up with their last few catches, Mike had hooked a base right in the eye. It bled all the way up to the surface and all over the boat as they took the hook out. They washed the blood out as best they could and prepared to pack up when they noticed the same bubble and ripple trail Claire and I had seen, heading straight for them. Now seriously freaked, Rob had grabbed the oars without another word and booked it back to shore. Between that day and the day we left, the three of them had slowly told Mike and me the previous incidents and encounters, but at this point I had been sure they were just trying to freak us out as a going away present. Kurt finished off our trip by telling us of a local urban legend, one he was convinced we'd encountered for real. Keep in mind, what I'm writing here is from memory and what Kurt told us, so if there are any inaccuracies with geography or historical evidence, that's on him. In his words, the story begins over 200 years ago. A wagon train full of settlers headed west got lost and turned around in the winter snowstorms. Instead of following their path, the settlers ended up going north. They came upon a small lake in the middle of northern Wisconsin and decided to make camp there, 
hoping to ride out the rest of the winter storms rather than risking continuing and getting more lost. They didn't make it, and their story was forgotten for a century before prospective hunters and fishermen came upon the lake, hoping for a good place to stake out for the season. After exploring and doing some digging into what appeared to be an old, abandoned campsite, they found the remains. The majority of what they found were animal bones, oxen and horses and other livestock that the settlers would have had with them. However, out of the 150 people estimated to have been part of the wagon train, only about 20-something remains were found. Theories abounded about what could have happened. Some speculated the settlers suffered a similar fate to the Donner Party, forced into cannibalism to survive the brutal winter before moving on once the snow abated. Others wanted to blame a hostile Native American tribe for slaughtering the settlers and taking the bodies back to their lands, but no evidence of this was found either. The local tribe, the Ojibwe, keep in mind, these are Kurt's words so I have no idea how accurate this may be, offered another scenario. They told of a terrible creature, half man and half bear, that stood over ten feet tall and could swim underwater for hours at a time. It can scent blood from miles away and is incredibly territorial. The tribe had stories about how they sent their strongest and bravest warriors to kill the creature, but none of them ever returned. Most of the older tribesmen refused to speak of it or even name it. The creature's territory is apparently centered around the lake and radiates for several miles in all directions. The disappearance of the wagon train in the 2800s was the first instance of a large-scale attack. The slaughter of the Ojibwe warriors was the second. Essentially, it's a local native version of Bigfoot, except moderately more terrifying. The natives had a name for it, and I'm probably butchering the spelling, but I've tried spelling it out phonetically since I've never seen it written anywhere and unfortunately, this seems to be a small enough legend that Google is no help. They call it the Ashwanabi Mukwa. Mike and I laughed it off and all of us parted in good spirits. Still not convinced of anything but a little wary, if only subconsciously. August 16, 2006. Kurt and Rob were hunting in the woods shortly after we'd left and happened upon something truly terrifying. They emailed us the next day with the story and this time pictures. Now the email began. Bears usually mark their territory by clawing trees at the edges of their territory, leaving distinctive markings. However, these markings are rarely seen higher than six or seven feet from the ground. The mark Kurt found? Ten feet off the ground. Remember, he's six foot four. This was the only marking they found in the area, but decided against searching for too long. Clearly, whatever had made a marking that high off the ground was incredibly big and tall and neither of them were willing to risk running into it. They'd only been in the area for about an hour or so, having driven in and parked the car on a dirt road before heading off to hunt. When they returned to the car, they saw something that scared them so much that, to this day, they have not returned to that hunting spot. Over the tracks of their tire were two humongous footprints. One of the photos shows Kurt's foot next to the print for a size comparison and it's important to not he wears a size 12. Even more disturbing was that to achieve that stride, the thing had to be at least nine feet tall and walking on two legs, something a bear is not capable of. The depth of the holes the claws left behind was enough to scare the daylights out of them. I'm still a skeptic about urban legends and otherworldly supernatural occurrences, but I know my cousins well enough to know that they would never fake something like this. So, either someone is playing a very elaborate hoax on them, or there is indeed something out there. I'm not saying one or the other. June 2007. A couple just outside of Lac du Flambeau, outside the supposed creature's usual roaming area, reported a vandalism to the local authorities. What baffled the couple and confused the police was their story. Over the course of several days, the couple had attempted to set up elaborate bird feeders, hoping to attract birds to photograph. They set up the birdhouse, left for the day for work, and returned in the evening to find the birdhouse demolished. Thinking they hadn't set it up correctly, they bought a new one and set it out the next morning. Rinse and repeat for over a week. Finally fed up with whatever could be doing it, 
They suspected vandalism and decided to stay home one day, hoping to catch the culprit in the act. They set up one last bird feeder and spent the day lounging around the house, but nothing happened. Finally, as dusk settled and they prepared dinner, the husband heard a noise coming from the backyard. Grabbing flashlights, the two of them ran outside to confront whoever was destroying the birdhouse. What they described was what confused the police. Both the husband and the wife claimed to have seen what resembled a bear standing on two legs, ripping the birdhouse apart with its front paws. When they turned on their flashlights and directed the beams at the creature, it turned and lumbered away still on two legs before disappearing into the woods. Things to keep in mind. Bear paws don't have the dexterity to pick up and rip apart a birdhouse, and they certainly can't actually run away on two at most. They can only take a few steps before dropping back to all fours, as their legs are too stumpy to allow them to reach a substantial speed. And it didn't gallop in the way bears usually move. The couple described its movements as a lumbering walk more akin to when a monkey walks on two legs. Police investigated the area with canines, but were unable to turn up anything. The couple didn't report any further vandalism. July 2007. We were visiting the cousins again. Nothing much happened over the two weeks we were there except for one instance. Sam and Mike were walking down to a lake, more like an overly large pond near the house one afternoon when they heard what sounded like a bear moving through the foliage to their side. The two of them were on the dirt road, so they turned to see if they could make out whatever it was making the noise. They both claimed to have seen something tall, large, and incredibly shaggy in the distance lumbering off into the shadows. Needless to say, they turned around and came straight back to the house. Nothing else happened that year. July 2008. The whole family sans Kurt was visiting us in California for two weeks. Kurt stayed home because he couldn't get any off time from his job. He'd been home alone before, with just Magic and DJ for company, and being both a police officer and a seasoned hunter, he was not scared of being alone. However, one day he calls us to talk about an incident that had occurred the night before. When he spoke, his voice actually shook a bit. I don't think he'd cried or anything, but he was certainly shaken. Apparently, around 11 at night, Right as Kurt was about to go to bed, DJ and Magic started barking like crazy, staring out the side window towards the backyard with their tails up and hair raised. Normally, they only get like that when they scent bears or other predators while hunting, and are otherwise very calm and quiet. When Kurt approached the sliding doors to try and see what could have been making them so agitated, they fell quiet except for whining very quietly their tails tucking tightly between their legs. Kurt told us he heard what sounded to be something incredibly large moving around right outside the fence, but the house had no exterior lights that pointed in that direction so he couldn't see anything. The dogs refused to budge from their position, so he moved to close the curtains just in case something moved into their sight and set them off again. Right as he did so, he said he heard a noise he could only describe as horrific. A deep, brassy growl with a screech overlaying it, just like Rob had heard so many years ago that night he'd snuck out. This time, however, it sounded as if the creature was just outside the fence, hidden by the shadows. Kurt proceeded to lock every single window and door, switch on every light in the house, and then take both dogs into the master bathroom, the only room in the house with no windows and lock the door, staying there until morning. Luckily, nothing else happened that summer. It's been many years since then, and unfortunately, I have not kept in close contact with my cousins. Rob moved out sometime around 2011 when he enrolled in college and hasn't been home since. Sam joined the Marines in 2012 and hasn't been home either. Claire hasn't been in contact with me, and Aunt Kelly had a sort of falling out with my mom, so they haven't been speaking either. I don't know if anything else has happened over these past few years, and this little local legend seems to be low-key enough that googling anything about it doesn't yield many results. So again, I'm not a believer in aliens or Bigfoot or ghosts or anything else really. I don't want to say I'm a skeptic, I like to keep an open mind, but I haven't seen much to give me definitive proof either. These encounters have been the closest I've come to anything of the sort.
and I'm still not quite sure what to think. I'm just glad to have written this all down somewhere. About two years ago, my younger brother passed away, and I've had weird things happen since, like I've had a magpie follow me home and stand about a foot away from me. But the one thing that really stood out is, I was on my way home after going out to get new art supplies, and I was sat on a bus that I usually don't get on, and there was a little girl and her mother sat on the row behind me. Everything was normal until we stopped at a red light, and the little girl started saying, Mammy, Mammy, there's a ghost. And she was saying the ghost was really kind, but out of nowhere she started describing the ghost, and the description was identical to my brother. It doesn't seem that weird, but that day when I got home the picture of me and my two brothers that's usually on my desk was face up on the floor, there was no one home and my window was closed. So I'm not sure if this is just a coincidence or paranormal, but it's freaking me out a little bit. I've had a fair few creepy experiences working in pubs over the years. Convinced pubs must attract energy ghosts. They also tend to be old, especially in the UK. I had a creepy cellar experience in Brighton, was getting ice out the ice machine in the cellar, was a really busy night and I was in a rush. Turned around because I felt like someone was looking at me. And in the opposite end of the cellar was a man in a bowler hat just stood there in the corner. Turned back to the ice machine as I was too busy to freak out over it, looked up again and he was gone. Gave me such a fright, and had to walk up the stairs straight back into a chaotic shift. Lots of other things as well over the years in loads of different pubs. Hearing footsteps after close, being tapped, but there's no one there, lights turning off and on, hand dryers turning on and off in a closed pub, hearing voices in a closed pub, things going missing and turning up in random places. One time we were drinking a pint post shift and a loud noise that sounded like a drip tray being dropped happened. We tried to see what had fallen or would make the noise and nothing had moved. We went back to drink our pints and it happened again. This time we didn't move but carried on chatting and ignoring it. Next we heard footsteps walking around. We went to check everywhere to check there was definitely no one in the pub. The loud noise happened again, followed by much louder footsteps, and really quiet talking couldn't hear what was said followed by a heavy door opening by itself. We decided to ditch the pints and get out of there. Frightened the life out of us, was with people who firmly didn't believe in ghosts, and even they were terrified. Hi, I don't know if this is even the right place for this, but my family is very spiritual, and I think spirits had something to do with the encounter. My mom always warns me about not going out late at night by myself, because there's been a lot of crime recently and why tempt fate? Better safe than sorry. Well, I didn't listen and walked out to do laundry last night around 10, 10 p.m. In the middle of folding clothes, I didn't go inside to fold because I wanted to put the clothes that were in the washer into the dryer after I finished folding the current load. This man comes up to my fence asking for money. This is something that has happened before but many years ago. It's the same scenario, late at night, a man approaches and is asking for money to take the L. I say I'm underage and my mom makes all the money and when he asks, well, can you ask her? I say she's at the store I know, I'm an idiot for saying I'm alone, my mom was working. He walks away and nothing happens. It's a trailer park with no security so anyone can literally walk in. My mom is protective and asks our neighbors who have a security camera to check and see who it is. Our neighbor checks all the way from 9pm to 11pm. The cameras show nothing. My mom keeps asking me, where was he? The neighbor checked and couldn't see anything. You don't even appear in the cameras. It's like you never went outside. My mom said a spirit is warning me to stay inside or something like this might actually happen. Can spirits even mess with video equipment like that? It scares the hell out of me. I literally swore on my mom's life I went outside.
Earlier this month, we visited the old fort in Key West called Fort Zachary Taylor. I believe I read that it was built in 1840s, and it's an old earthworks fort with lots of brick and most of the gun emplacements have been removed. But you can still tour around the fort and many of the area that the soldiers would have used such as the barracks, mess hall, chapel, powder storage, and etc. Just off the chapel was one of the smaller rooms which looked like maybe it was used as a cell. That particular room didn't have a description plaque, but most of the other areas did. My wife and I walked inside just to look around. It was all brick and like seven foot by five foot wide with iron bars over the window. When we stepped inside, we both smelled the smell of pipe tobacco. Like if just moments before we entered, someone just smoked a pipe. It was a very sweet tobacco smell. I knew it was pipe tobacco because I smoke a pipe every once in a while. The thing is the smell never faded while we were in that room. We looked around like WTF is going on. Once we exited the room, the smell disappeared. There were hardly any other tourists around the fort when we were there. There was an Asian family with kids all under 10, a couple of ladies walking around and a Hispanic family with small kids. The thing is no one we saw looked like they would be smoking with kids around and especially on a historical site like this. I tried looking around to see if there was someone nearby who would have smoked a pipe, but no one. I can't explain it, but we walked into a cell room that had pipe tobacco smell only inside that small room and nowhere else. What do you think it was? So I was sick the other week and chilling on the sofa. My dog was on the other sofa sleeping. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw this weird black void thing about the size of a small cat jump down the side of the dog and seemed to disappear into the sofa. My initial thought was it was in my head, but the dog reacted to it. She jumped up with a WTF type expression, sniffed herself where I saw it land on her, and then start sniffing the sofa to try and figure out what happened. I have cats, but they're all light in color and would have chased them if they did that to her. I called my son in the room, thinking maybe a bat got in somehow. We searched everywhere, moved the sofa out, searched in the cushions and looked under it with a flashlight. Nothing. I'm starting to think it was a past kitty of ours that really liked dogs. He would have totally done something like that to mess with a dog. Someone found him as a kitten, and he had that FIV virus and unfortunately died young. He had a big personality, though. I spent three months working in Alaska in a remote area about two hours north of Anchorage during the summer five years ago. It was summertime, so the darkest it would get would be considered dusk anywhere else. I often took walks down to the river alone, which was about a three-mile walk from my compound, very secluded and quiet. One evening I wasn't tired and decided to head to the river to see if I could find any wildlife wandering around I love animals. It was about 2 a.m. It was the darkest time of day. The sun wasn't visible, but it wasn't completely dark. When I got to the river, I poked around for a while and listened to my surroundings. Then I heard the most eerie sound of my life. I heard what sounded like the alien ships from War of the Worlds. It was like a trombone sound multiplied by a thousand. It was so loud I covered my ears. There was no construction, no people playing instruments. Nothing that could explain what this sound was. Christmas of 27 was an event that has always stood out in my mind, and now it always will. I was 13 at the time, and that was the first and only year that Dad missed Christmas. He worked as a long-haul truck driver, and we were used to him being gone for weeks or even occasional months at a time. He always made it a point to be home for our birthdays and Christmas, however, but that year was different. Mom was worried when he said he had one final load to deliver before the holiday season. His plan was to make his delivery and then be home on the 23rd just in time for Christmas, but Mother Nature had other ideas. As fate would have it, his route from our home in Minneapolis to Billings, Montana would take him right into the heart of a looming blizzard along I-94. 
Snow was falling in bunches at the time, and Dad said he was debating whether or not to pull over for the night in hopes it would clear up. He decided to try and just keep going when the road made the decision for him. He was only about an hour away from Billings when his truck struck an unexpected patch of ice, causing him to lost control and slide off the road into the median. Thankfully, he wasn't injured, but his truck was wedged in nearly two feet of packed snow. It was around midnight when this happened. He tried everything he could to get the truck out of the snowdrift, but it was no use. Of course, his phone signal was non-existent as well, so he couldn't even call for assistance. The roads were virtually devoid of other travelers by that point as well. He radioed into a local emergency office, but was told the roads were too hazardous to travel at the moment. In the end, he could do nothing but wait. Meanwhile, Christmas came and went for us, and we didn't hear anything from Dad. Mom was a nervous wreck, although she tried to hide it, while me and my two sisters were just sad that he wasn't there with us. Thankfully, Dad finally called late on Christmas evening. He apologized profusely for not being with us and promised he would get home as soon as possible. He did just that two days later, and we were relieved to have him back. He returned with a bundle of late Christmas gifts and all was well once more. Dad was different though. He was quiet and appeared as though his mind was focused elsewhere. I didn't question him on it, but I could tell that something was troubling him. Life went on, and Dad never missed another Christmas after that. He in fact began just taking the entire month of December off to prevent anything like that ever happening again. I didn't know this at the time, but he later told me that he never drove down I-94 again. He outright refused deliveries that took him along that stretch, and would take detours that added multiple hours to his trip if it meant avoiding that spot. Us kids are all grown up now with kids of our own. My son just turned two, and our whole family was once again together over this previous Christmas. We sat around watching as mom and dad lovingly spoiled their grandchildren with goodies. I don't think I've ever seen my dad with such a beaming smile. Later that night when the sugar rush had finally worn off and the kids had gone to bed, dad and I were left alone on the balcony. We sipped some of his whiskey and puffed on cigars as we got to talking. I'll skip over the bulk of what we talked about, because that's not really why I'm here. Eventually, we started talking about his newfound retirement from truck driving, and I asked him a question which I'd never really asked before. You ever experience anything really creepy on the road? Dad was no stranger to talking about his experiences. He had infamous tales of him getting mobbed by crackheads in Atlanta hitting a cow in Nebraska and the things he saw while driving through Ferguson a few years back during the civil unrest. He was never shy to tell them, but this time he paused. He swished the whiskey around his glass for a moment, as if silently debating whether he wanted to tell me. I guess I might as well tell you now. He downed the remainder of his drink and clasped his hands in front of him. You remember the year I missed Christmas? By this point, I had almost entirely forgotten about it, but when he said that a torrent of memories came spiraling back. Yeah, mom was pissed. I replied. Dad gave a hearty chuckle at that and nodded. Oh yeah, she never let me forget it. That was that crazy blizzard, right? When your truck got stuck, Dad nodded. Yup, damn near flipped my rig that night. Ironically, that snowdrift probably saved my life just as much as it screwed me over. He then paused and broke eye contact as he contemplated his wording. That wasn't the scary part, though. Dad explained that the area he went off the road was essentially a barren wasteland. No cities or gas stations around him, just a winding expanse of road in both directions between dozens of foothills. He again mentioned he had no cell reception and wasn't sure what to do aside from just wait for someone to pass by. After a few minutes, it became apparent that wasn't going to happen. The snow fell in buckets that night, and before long, it nearly reached the bottom of his door. Dad's truck at the time was a Cascadia 125 mid-roof sleeper. He had a full sleeping compartment behind the front seat, and provisions to last him a few weeks if necessary. 
He wasn't too worried about being stranded, at least not at first. After giving up on getting his phone to work, he crawled into the bunk area of the cab and popped a DVD in his portable TV. He figured he may be stuck out there for at least the night, so he might as well just relax until help arrived. He made sure to insist that if he wanted to, he could have probably figured out a way to get his truck out if he really tried, but he was exhausted and decided to just get some sleep. He said he drifted off not long after, only to awake sometime later to complete darkness. The temperature had plummeted, and he instinctually hugged his arms and felt the goosebumps lining his arms. He'd left his truck idling before he fell asleep, but it wasn't running anymore. Confused, he crawled into the front seat to find the keys still in the ignition. He twisted the key and the engine soon rumbled back to life, but something was wrong. He said the noise of the engine morphed into a gurgling, clanging mess of metal and fluid that produced a god-awful cacophony. His dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree displaying just about every single warning light the system had. Steam began to pour from the hood vents, and the distinct smell of boiling coolant filled the air. After letting it run maybe ten seconds, he shut it off in fear of doing permanent damage to it. He knew that something wasn't right with it, and sighed as he contemplated going out into the cold night to see if he could figure out what it was. He bundled himself up tight and popped the hood. He said the night had this almost ethereal silence to it as he stepped out of the cab. His feet crunched in the snow, echoing like crashing thunder when compared to the pervasive silence. He made his way around the front and opened it up, releasing a plume of steam from within. After it dissipated a bit, he leaned in and found something which made him quite confused. Oil and coolant was splashed all over the underside of the hood, with many other parts of the engine covered in gunk as well. Dad climbed off the grill and glanced underneath the carriage, and that's when he found something truly odd. The oil pan was shredded on the bottom of the engine. He said it looked as though someone had chopped it with an axe a couple dozen times. The oil had all spilled out into the snow beneath. Clearly that was why the engine had been running so rough, but explaining how it happened was another matter entirely. He checked around the area and said it seemed like some of the oil was dripped away from the road and towards the trees. He looked closer and spied what very much seemed like footprints accompanying them. As if the winter night wasn't cold enough, that discovery really tanked his blood temperature. He quickly headed back towards his cab, but as he reached for the handle, something stopped him dead in his tracks. Something moved behind the end of his trailer, too quick to make out any physical details. It moved on two legs and was clearly no animal. Dad just froze, his fight or flight instinct seeming to stalemate within him. He thought about calling out, but said that didn't seem like a good idea. After a few seconds of silence, he made a mad dash to his cab and locked the doors behind him. After grabbing the pistol from underneath his seat, he hopped into the rear with his heart racing. He positioned himself where he was able to glance out both side mirrors, but saw no sign of whoever was behind the trailer. The radio too was out, and after trying in vain to get it to work, he sat back. It didn't make any sense to him, even if the engine wouldn't fire up the batteries should have had enough reserve charge to power the radio for a little while. He tried calling on this cell phone too, and although managed to get it to ring a few times, it would always just cut out. Hours passed and not much of anything happened. He dosed off once or twice, but tried his best to stay awake and wait for the sun to rise. The snow had since stopped, but not a single other car had driven by since he had stopped. He figured the pass itself was closed, but hoped someone would have been by. Sometime later, he heard a noise emanate from outside. It started as a slight thump, with another soon following, then another and another. The sounds gradually grew louder, and his heart lodged in his throat as it grew nearer. Someone was on his trailer, and he didn't know what to do about it. He clutched his pistol tight, aiming it up towards the roof. Just as he was certain the person was about to reach the roof of the cab, the sound stopped. He waited there, pistol trembling in his grip for them to emerge, but they never did. Minutes turned to hours, and he never heard another sound from the roof. 
He said after a while he was no longer even sure whether he had heard anything to begin with. Eventually his guard slipped and the drowsiness took over. He doesn't know if this next part is related, but he's never had anything happen like it so I figured I'd include it too. He dreamed as he slept there, but it wasn't a normal dream. He said he remembers walking through a dark forest and viewing it all with incredible vivid detail. He was completely lucid and says to this day almost 30 years later, it was the most incredibly realistic dream he's ever had. Even looking back on it, he says it felt so real it's hard for him to distinguish it from reality. He seemed genuinely disturbed as he told me about it too. The forest he was walking through had these massive looming trees that seemed hundreds of feet tall. Twisted roots surrounded their bases which sprouted from the ground and twisted all over like the tentacles of the kraken. He had to dip and duck around them as he moved, going further but not knowing why. As he made his way through, he started hearing this noise like the ticking of a clock. It got louder as he moved, then sure enough he found the source. A large grandfather clock ticking away in the middle of the bundle of roots. He stopped and stared at it for a moment as it ticked away. The clock's tone reverberated, but began to slow. In a few moments it had began ticking much slower, and the clock itself began to melt. Suddenly he saw things emerging in the distance from behind the trees. Horrible twisted creatures like the spawns of hell. The sounds of cackling and snarling swirled around him, and he began to run. He hurtled and leapt through the roots, but didn't make it far. Something struck him hard from behind, knocking him onto his chest. He then awoke with a gasp, panting heavily with a cold sweat permeating his entire body. He scrambled to a seated position while on the brink of panic. His heart was throbbing so fast and hard that it ached. He took a moment to compose himself, and the immense relief that overcame him was one of sheer relief, but it did not last. Something moved at his window, and his eyes shot up. There he saw the face staring back at him. He froze, as stiff as a corpse and cold as a glacier. Time seemed to stand still then, but finally he found the strength to raise his pistol. He fired without really even thinking. A loud bang reverberated in and the muzzle flare momentarily disoriented him. He looked up to see a bullet hole in the window and no sign of the face. After waiting there a few moments, he ventured to the driver's seat and peered out but there was nothing there. No sign of that thing ever being there. It didn't make sense to him, as he was certain he saw it. What made even less sense was the fact that his phone read that it was only 12.13 a.m. Last he remembered checking his phone at read 12.08 a.m., and he swears on everything that had to have been at least an hour before he dozed off. By this point in his story, I had to question myself on whether he was pulling my leg. My father is a bit of a prankster for sure, but he's never weaved an elaborate story like this before. He then spent some time glancing around out the windows and ensuring no one else was around. He almost thought he should just leave his truck and start walking back to town, but obviously that was an incredibly dangerous notion that probably would have gotten him killed. He stared at his phone for quite a while, watching the minutes slowly tick onward. Too slowly. He swore time wasn't working as normal. Several times he counted aloud to 60 doing his best to approximate a minute, but the minute didn't change accordingly. He eventually just kept counting upwards, finding the minute finally changed when he reached 386. You'd think that after all these worrying discoveries that sleep would have been the last thing he wanted, but it wasn't enough to prevent. He said he tried adamantly to resist the urge, but the drowsiness that overtook him was impossible to fight. He found himself walking in the snow, listening as it crunched beneath his feet. A dark and silent forest surrounded him in all directions. It was robotic, as if his body acted of its own accord while his mind drifted in the doldrums. He could barely see where he was going, but it didn't seem to matter. Suddenly he stopped and seemed to spring back to reality. He glanced around side to side a sudden terror gripping him. Where was he? Why was he outside of his truck? He wondered. He spun back, but couldn't even see the road behind him. The cold sunk into him, and then he saw it. 
From further in the woods, a familiar face stared back, pale, gaunt, and inhuman. It crawled on all fours, shimmering and shifting side to side. My father turned the complete other way and ran like hell. Tree branches raked against him as he fled half blind away from the thing in the woods. Nothing looked familiar, and he just continued running aimlessly through the woods, checking behind him periodically to see if the thing was following him. He never saw it or heard it, but he knew it was there. Eventually, he smelled the faint scent of smoke lingering in the air. He followed it, hearing a commotion behind him and soon came across a small clearing. In the center of it was a log cabin with smoke trickling from the chimney. Seeing no other option, he dashed towards it and knocked on the door. Behind him, he could hear odd sounds coming from the woods, and thankfully the door opened a few seconds later. Who are you? What do you want? The voice of elderly man called from within. Dad turned and saw the barrel of a shotgun aimed at his chest. He slowly raised his hands to convey he meant no threat. Please, sir. There's. He said he paused as he thought that certainly this man was going to think he was some lunatic, but he said it anyways. There's something out there. The man's furious glance reverted to one of intrigue. He then looked past my dad and out into the forest, his eyes suddenly growing wide. Suddenly he backed up, still aiming the shotgun and my dad while waving him inside. He pointed him over to a chair in the corner. Dad complied and sat as the man locked up behind him. He waited there a couple seconds there, but apparently heard nothing of concern. What are you doing out here? My dad then told him what had happened with his truck and the blizzard. He then told him about the odd occurrences that had happened later on which culminated in him suddenly sleepwalking through the woods. The man sighed and finally lowered his shotgun. He got my dad some water and took a seat across from him. Lot of weird things in these woods. Dad paused as he waited for the man to continue. The man formally introduced himself as Duncan and said his family had owned that plot of land for nearly 100 years. He said he lost count of how many search parties had come through over the years, as well as thrill-seekers, ghost hunters, and generally odd people. I saw a face. Dad finally confessed to him. Duncan eyed him curiously. What kind of face? Dad described it much as he had before, and Duncan just shook his head. Well, that's a new one. He let out a sarcastic chuckle then. You hear all kinds of stories. UFOs, Bigfoot cults, but none of them can ever provide proof. So you don't believe in any of it? My dad asked, only to be countered by Duncan. Of course I do. I've lived out here long enough to know that we humans do not dictate these woods. There are things that lurk in shadows all over the globe, and we may never understand them. But as for what you saw... He paused for a moment, seeming to contemplate as he folded his hands on his lap. There's a group of Native Americans that are rumored to have once lived here. The Apulkery. Ever hear of them? Dad shook his head. Neither had I. But a friend of mine who has since passed told me about him. He was an Arapaho man himself, and said that for generations his people had told tales of these. Apulkery. Most other groups feared them, said the things they did were evil, more so than the standard tribal warfare one would expect. People say they held these rituals and experiments, and were rumored that their cruelty was matched only by their intellects. Some people say they weren't even human, but that's neither here nor there. Duncan trailed off once more, taking a sip of tea from his side table. One of the rumors that many people attribute to the Apulkari is that of the wrong ones. A lot of names for them, really. Not rights, liars, and uncannies. Things that look human but ain't, and some look less human than others. Long faces, wide mouths, huge eyes. A lot of variations. Some say they can affect time and space itself, and others blame them for a lot of weird disappearances. He paused and took another sip, then chuckled. I can't speak to the validity of all that firsthand but things for certain. There are a lot of weird disappearances, and no one seems to have an answer for them. The air from the room seemed to deflate from his torso, 
and Dad eyed the curious man. He'd clearly seen a lot over his time, but Dad didn't know how much of his tales to believe. He still doesn't. If all these things are happening, then why do you live out here? Dad finally asked. Duncan reclined in the seat and thought. Dad expected an answer related to his inherited property, but the reality was a bit different. He did in fact mention his ancestral home being part of it, but had more to say. If I was 20 years younger, maybe I would leave, but I don't think it'd matter. There ain't a place on earth you could run to if they wanted to get you. Dad said a shiver descended his spine then, and Duncan didn't seem boastful or wild as he spoke, but more as though his realization was just a foregone conclusion. Thankfully, Duncan allowed my dad to stay the night, and in the morning the two of them made their way back to the road. Luckily, Duncan had a big Dodge Diesel that was able to plow through the snow with relative ease. They soon reached my dad's abandoned rig, finding it in even worse state than he'd last seen it the previous night. Multiple tires were slashed, windows were broken, and the engine was absolutely shredded from the bottom. After looking around, though, he found nothing had actually been stolen. Duncan gave him a ride into town to get his truck towed, and a week or so later, he was finally headed home. So, do you believe in that kind of stuff? I finally asked him after he seemed to be done retelling his story. Well, I'd be kind of stupid not to know. He and I both laughed at that, but clearly he had more he wanted to say. It was a really weird experience for sure, but I've always thought that maybe I misremembered it or subconsciously exaggerated it in my mind. Something about it, though, is just so haunting. Like I saw something that night that I really wasn't supposed to see and never want to see again. He just sat there for a moment in silence, and I figured it best not to ask him any more questions. He eventually told me that between the time of him crashing his truck to when he finally made it into town with Duncan that three entire days had passed. He still doesn't know how to account for that, and apparently Duncan didn't either. There's a lot of unanswered questions to this that he may never get the answer to now. He kept in touch with Duncan over the years, but unfortunately he passed away back in 2019. I love my dad, and it's disconcerting seeing him that way. Confused and terrified. I cannot completely attest to the validity of his story, but I believe him. For many who read this, I'm sure it will just amount to words on a paper, or maybe a fictitious story that entertained you for a few minutes, but to me it's a horrific possibility at the very least. If anyone has any experiences like this or theories, then feel free to share them. Whatever the case, you won't catch me anywhere near I-94 in Billings anytime soon. Anyway, this story I am going to tell you now comes from one summer when I was working with the National Park Service out in Yellowstone. I was lucky enough to spend five years working for the park, and to this day it is still one of my favorite locations. Now, for those of you who have not been to Yellowstone before, let me just tell you that this park is big. So big, in fact, that many park rangers believe that there are hermits who live off the grid in the park year-round in some of the remote places that don't see tourists and visitors, and are able to go more or less undetected because there are so many places you could hide. Over the years there, I encountered some really weird stuff in the Yellowstone wilderness that would suggest that this is either true, or that there is some strange dark energy at play out there. But the dark energy doesn't confine itself to the park boundaries, as I found out one year. Midsummer, when I was 27, two of my co-workers who I'll call Nick and Monica instead of using their real names and I had the same day off and decided to go out to a nearby lake in southern Montana, right outside the northwest corner of the park. Nick used to be a scuba diving instructor and had a ton of gear along with a few wetsuits so we decided to scuba dive and explore around the submerged ruins in Quake Lake. For those of you who don't know the story of how Quake Lake was formed, here's a quick history. In August 1959, a magnitude 7.3 earthquake struck the area in the middle of the night, causing a large chunk of one of the mountains to fall in a landslide that buried 19 people alive in their sleep and created a dam in the Madison River. This dam resulted in the creation of Quake Lake, 
as it later was named. Overall, the area affected by the earthquake had a total of 28 fatalities, and damage was reported in a huge radius around the area. The part of all this that the public doesn't know about, however, is the disappearances that started happening after the formation of Quake Lake that had nothing to do with the earthquake and subsequent damage. The government did a very thorough job covering all of it up as to not alarm the public, and most NPS employees don't even know about it unless they are working directly in the area. As a five-year veteran working at Yellowstone, I knew about the strange disappearances and unsolved cases, but I was told under strict order not to tell anyone about them. Basically, once Quake Lake was deemed stable enough for recreational activity, people started going out there to swim, fish, go boating, and do all the other normal things that people do on a lake. However, soon after the lake started getting visitors, people started mysteriously disappearing, all from the same area of the lake. Sometimes they would turn up all the way across the lake drowned. Sometimes they would never turn up at all. But the thing that made the government cover this all up was that with each body they actually found, the person died with a look of absolute terror on their face and bruises around their legs and ankles that looked like the shape of human hands. The government did countless tests and surveys of the lake to try to determine what this could be from, but they never found anything. So they covered it all up and placed restrictions on areas that could be accessed by the general public. Despite knowledge of the disappearances, Nick, Monica, and I weren't worried about it. Nick assured us that all his diving gear was in top shape, and since Monica and I were both strong swimmers, we didn't give it a second thought. The area that we were going to dive at is called the Underwater Forest. It was given that name because of all the trees you can still see sticking out of the water from when the lake originally formed. We knew there were some underwater ruins close by as well from a cabin that got submerged in the flooding, so we figured that would be a really cool place to dive and explore. So we packed up all of the diving gear and are into Nick's car, hooked his boat up to the trailer hitch, and set out for the lake. It was just about midday when we got there. We had a quick picnic lunch, then started to put our gear on while we digested. Nick gave both Monica and I a quick tutorial on how to use all of the gear, and we did a few test dives next to the boat dock to make sure we were ready. Once we felt good to go, we took off for the side of the lake we were going to explore. As soon as we arrived, we anchored our boat and got ready to jump in. Immediately I got a bad feeling like we shouldn't be there, but I brushed it off as nervousness and excitement. I touched the water next to the boat, and it sent chills up my spine. The water in the lake was cold, but this felt really, really cold. I shuddered, then Nick noticed and started making fun of me, so I rolled my eyes and put on my mask. We jumped in the water and started exploring. As soon as I got in the water, all my fears went away. This place was so cool. It was like a whole forest frozen in time, dead underwater. We had all agreed ahead of time to try to stay near each other, but just in case, Nick had given us all waterproof diving watches so we could keep track of time. We agreed that we would surface every 20 minutes just to check in with each other if we got separated. Naturally, within about five minutes, we were all off on our own, but we all surfaced on time for the first two check-ins. However, on the third check-in, Monica didn't surface on time. Nick and I waited a couple minutes, thinking that maybe she just didn't look at her watch. After about 10 minutes, we started to panic. We made a plan to stick together to look for her, and immediately dove back down into the water. We searched for about 20 minutes and there was no sign of her. We decided to return to the boat and radio into the marina to get help and within a matter of minutes they had sent a search and rescue team out to help find her. Every single minute waiting felt like an eternity. Then suddenly, one of the search and rescue divers surfaced, with Monica's unconscious body. All of her diving gear had been torn to shreds and was just barely hanging on to her. The search and rescue boat sped off back to the marina so Monica could be airlifted to the nearest hospital. Nick and I closely followed behind in his boat. Once we got back to the marina, we were questioned by the cops and then released. They told us where they were taking Monica, 
and Nick and I made plans to go visit her the next morning. Neither Nick nor I was able to sleep that night. We sat on the couch together at his apartment watching movies until the sun came up, and then we got in his car and headed for the hospital where Monica was. She was asleep when we got there, so we decided wait until she woke up. We asked one of the nurses if she had said what happened, and the nurse said she hadn't spoken a single word to anyone since she arrived. She also said that Monica would start to freak out if anyone tried to touch her ankles. Hearing this made the blood drain from my face. Once the nurse left the room, I slowly and gently lifted up the blanket by Monica's feet and looked. There were deep dark red and purple bruises all over her calves and ankles in the shape of human hands, as if people had been grabbing at her and dragging her by the bottoms of her legs. The feeling of the blanket moving immediately woke Monica up, and she jolted up in a panic with the widest eyes I have ever seen. As soon as she realized it was just Nick and I, she started crying. I sat down next to her on the bed and just held her. I asked her if she wanted to talk about what happened, and once she calmed down, what she said I will never forget. I saw a little girl, she was standing upright on the lake floor as if she was outside on dry land. She motioned to me to follow her, so I did. She was running through the trees, and once we got to the edge of the underwater forest, there was a cabin with a light on inside. She pointed at the door and then ran inside. I was terrified, but curious, so I followed her in. As soon as I opened the door and entered the cabin, the little girl turned to me, smiled, and turned out the light. The cabin door swung shut and locked. I couldn't open it back up as hard as I tried. I swam to one of the windows and started hitting it until the glass cracked. I tried to squeeze through the window, but the oxygen tank was too big to fit. I felt something grab at my ankle, and I turned around and there was the little girl, although she now was floating in the water and she looked like a corpse. Her skin was gray and falling off her bones and her eyes were solid white. Out of nowhere, two more of these people appeared. They looked like her parents, perhaps. They started grabbing at me and pulling me back into the cabin, tearing at my wetsuit with their nails and teeth. I fought as hard as I could and tore off my oxygen tank and started fighting them off with it. I managed to kick them off of me just as I was able to squeeze through the broken window, and I swam as fast as I could away from the cabin without turning back. Within a matter of seconds, I was so out of breath that I passed out, and the next thing I knew I was in the hospital. Monica said that she told the search and rescue officers everything she told us. We were told that they did a thorough search operation for the cabin Monica said she saw, but they claimed that they found nothing. I'm not sure what exactly happened that day in the lake, but I do know that what I saw on Monica's legs, plus the fear in her eyes when she told Nick and I her story, I believe her. I have never gone back to that lake, but I did hear from a co-worker that they now have that area strictly closed off. Maybe they did find something after all. One early morning, I got ready to go to the corner store before my kids had to go to school and my wife had to go to work right after. I grabbed the keys and didn't tell my wife I was leaving, but I was sure she saw me leave and heard the keys. About 10 minutes later, she texts me, but I'm already heading back, so I ignore it. As I pull up, I read one of them, and she was asking if I had left yet, and I did so I got out the car and rushed inside to see if everything was okay. She comes out asking me if I was sitting on the couch a while ago and said no. But she said she saw me on the couch sitting like I was mad and walked up to me a bit and asked if I was okay. It didn't move much or say much, but my wife was freaked out enough and went to the room waiting to see if it was going to follow her. She then looked out the window and saw I took her car and got even more scared. And that's when she said she texted me. I've had a few experiences as well, but those will be separate stories. Thank you for listening, and this story is very real and hope you enjoyed it. If you are reading this, just know I know what a skinwalker is. But I really wanted to be in this group, so I added the skinny part. But I'm sure it's some kind of mimic. Thank you.
Thursday, August 17th at around 2.30 in the morning, I believe, I woke up to this loud screeching sound. It was sharp and short. It came in intervals of four and then would stop for about 30 seconds and then kick up again. It did this about three times before it started to die down. Fortunately, I was able to record two of the single sounds, which I will attempt to post after this so you guys can hear it immediately. I sent my friend, he will remain anonymous, the audio. He's really big on this kind of stuff, and he said that the sounds were coming from a windigo. Obviously, I'm here almost pissing myself because the screeching woke me up, and I've never had anything like this wake me up before. I've been living in the mountains since 2019. So I've heard my fair share of animal noises, and this wasn't like anything I've ever heard before. The said friend just told me to make sure my windows are locked and keep an eye on my pets, which never leave the house anyways. I feel I should mention that I do have chickens, but they are more my stepmom's responsibility. Anyways, after that I ended up reading a little on the creature, and then ended up going back to sleep. Because at this point it was three in the morning, even being super into the supernatural, I have never experienced their presence. It's one thing to hear stories, but being at the telling end of that story is so different. So that's really all I have to say. I guess I just need some I don't know connection. Maybe you guys can. Tell me about similar experiences so I don't feel so alone. And maybe you have some tips to keep myself safe. I'm not going out to poke to bear per se, so... Maybe if I just leave it alone, it won't F with me. I'm Chris, a park ranger, and have 11 years on my belt. Also experience comes with stories, many of which are ghost or paranormal stories. This story is true. Not going to say where I work, but it is a very large park. This story took place spring of 2008. The park that I worked at had a very big drinking problem with youths trespassing all the time. We had calls almost every night so I worked nights most of my career. One day a member of the public who were camping had called in saying that there were a large group of youths making noise and drinking. I was dispatched and starting walking over in the dark. I tried to sneak up this was a breach of my standard operating procedure to try to apprehend as many as I can I managed to apprehend four or five don't clearly remember and all the others ran into the woods my prediction was that were as many as 20 people from what I saw. I radioed through to dispatch to get a couple of deputies out here to take over. Deputies arrived at this point I was all alone in the middle of nowhere I radioed through to try to get guided back to the more civilized part of the woods at this point I had already walked quite far and radio connection was breaking up we had bad radios back Then as I approached a part of the woods I was similar with I looked behind me and saw someone walking up to me very slowly I then called out hello no response at this point radio contact was back I radioed in saying that I have spotted someone at this point, the figure is maybe 40 meters away. I then called out, stop, and are you okay? No response. As the figure came closer, it just disappeared. I couldn't make out what it was. Next day came a normal day mentioned to my friend who had worked here for 10 years. I mentioned what happened, and he made a scared face and said, it's nothing got up and walked away. In 2013, I left to work at the sheriff's office, never mentioned to anyone except some close friends while drunk. This might not be the scariest story, but I have only had a couple of other ghost stories, might put them on here later on. But this sends shivers down my spine as it is still unexplained, which makes the story even scarier. But I hope this interested some of you guys, I will submit more in the future. I have tried to contact some people that have worked in similar settings to see if they have similar experience, and by the looks of it, not many people have had similar experience, except some guys in search and rescue and border patrol. Also, I have read some stories of stuff like this in the UK. I might update if I have seen a similar story. I'm a park ranger named John and was driving down a remote road deep within the forest. I reached a point where the Mullica River ran parallel to the road. 
Up ahead, my headlights illuminated a large, dark figure emerging from the woods and making its way onto the roadway. Approaching cautiously, I saw the figure step right in front of my car, blocking my path. I had to bring my vehicle to a sudden halt to avoid hitting this enigmatic creature. The creature before me was something out of the ordinary. It stood well over six feet tall, its body covered in wet, matted black fur. Strangely, it appeared to lack forelegs but boasted a pair of massive, powerful hind legs. As I sat there, the creature's two piercing red eyes locked onto me through the car's windshield. It lingered for a few tense moments before abruptly turning and continuing its journey across the road, walking upright with a peculiar, almost robotic-like gait, eerily reminiscent of a human. Was this a dogman? I am describing my first experience that I can remember here. I believe I was 15 years old. I had gone to bed that Saturday night probably between the hours of 10 and 11 p.m. I lived in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. My bedroom was on the top floor of our house in a turret. There was a single bed on either side of the room which was in the shape of an octagon. I woke with a start and looked over at the other bed and saw my cat sleeping there. He always did. I then looked at the clock radio which had been acting strangely over the past few weeks. It had been turning itself on and off all by itself, usually around the same time at night. Perhaps I had gotten so used to it that's why I had woken, but the time on it said it was 12.15 am. I tried to roll over and go back to sleep. Suddenly I found myself paralyzed on my back, unable to move. There was a tall being beside me to the left. The right side of my bed was up against the wall. This being was also a shadow, but its eyes glowed white. It began to communicate with me via ESP. I was somehow able to communicate back with it the same way. I do not remember everything. I do remember it asking me if I wanted to join it on its ship. Then suddenly the craft appeared by the window in green, greenish blue and violet lights were flashing from a silver disc like UFO that was being operated by others that were in the room with me. It hovered there for several minutes. During this period of time, the shadowy being took what was to me, its index finger, and touched me on my solar plexus. I then woke in a start. My cat was not on the other bed and the clock radio said it was only midnight. I thought I had experienced a bad dream. The following morning I went to get into the shower and on my solar plexus was a marking. It remained there for a number of years and was very sensitive. It comes and goes now. When that spot on me is touched I feel as if endorphins are being released. I have had other experiences since this one such as sightings of strange things in the sky and being paralyzed in bed. Seeing strange lights flash and shadows. However, none were quite like this. I also had some inorganic materials exit my body only several months ago, which I am not comfortable showing to a doctor. Man, I am so shy to share because it really seems far-fetched. It was towards Christmas time important later and my spouse and I were hanging out at home. I looked up still in the house and saw him standing there. He looked just like the stereotypical garden gnome, red cap, beard and all. My memory is that his eyes got a little wide when he saw me looking, and he gave me what seemed like a jaunty little wave and a smile. Anyway, I turned to get my spouse's attention to see if he could see it too, and when I looked back he disappeared. I searched the whole house trying to prove to myself that I didn't imagine it. My spouse, being Norwegian, believes it was a tauntiness which is why I mention it being Christmas time. I've questioned myself thousands of times since, but I wasn't asleep, impaired in any way or have a tendency to hallucinate. One reason we might have attracted one, if it was real, is that we've always left a plate out for any creatures on New Year's Eve, typically a sweet, a little pickled herring and a drink of some sort, just to be friendly. I usually leave out a needle and thread as well so they could repair their clothes. In the morning, I take the remains outside for scavengers. I kind of saw it as a harmless little tradition that my husband's family does. 
but I'm a little more deliberate about not forgetting to leave it out these days. So, that's my story. I'm not convinced that it's logical in any way, but I do like the idea of there being a little magic left in this world. True story. This happened about 20 years ago, and it still gives me the willies I had invited a few friends over one night after work for a couple of beers, and we were just hanging out vibing and jiving some philosophy around the coffee table in the living room. I was somewhat absent-mindedly spinning a quarter 25 cent piece as the conversation progressed. I proposed an interesting question to my friends. How many sides does a coin have? A coin has two sides, of course, was the first response. Actually, that is incorrect, I retorted. Then I stopped the coin from spinning and flicked it one more time to let it spin again as I explained. A coin has three sides, the front, back, and the thinnest side being the edge or thickness of the coin. As I explained this, we all watched the coin slow down, and gradually it stopped spinning, only for it to stop perfectly balanced on its edge. The third side. We were all totally dumbstruck. It seemed too impossible to all be a coincidence. I have tried to make this happen again ever since, and I've never been successful. What do you guys think? We stayed at Lake George Battlefield Campground. Our last night camping was Sunday, July 16, this year, 2023. Right after midnight, my friends went to use the bathroom and left me alone by the fire when I heard a woman's voice singing in the woods. It was spooky, but also dreamlike. I describe it as singing because it sounded so practiced, but it was arpeggiated notes, no words. Would also describe it as sad and possibly ritualistic. Startled, I tried to record it because it was definitely audible. Figured if my ears can pick it up, so can a mic. No chance. I responded with vocals of my own and then asking who was there. No response. My friends returned about 10 minutes later and the singing stopped as I heard their footsteps approaching from the road. They told me it was bullfrogs. The pitch changes and length of the notes was no way a bullfrog forest animal. For reference, the campsite we stayed was 200 feet south of the Isaac Jogs Monument. There is a nature trail about 400 feet west, down the hill from our site. In front of the nature trail is the Tiki Hotel. We can see those lights through the foliage. I'm really thinking it was a someone practicing some Native American ritual. We've stayed at the same campsite every year for the past five, but this is our first time staying into Monday morning. Would anybody know what goes on out there on Sundays? hiking in Virginia two days in and 20 plus miles from anything. In the middle of the night, while we were sitting around the campfire, we hear a major commotion coming down the ridge above our trail. Out of nowhere, some guy hauls ass by our sight, wearing a jogging suit and small kid-sized backpack. Two minutes later, two other guys come down the hill from the same place, no trail, both leading German Shepherd and dressed in FBI-type clothing. I'm thinking we were close to some hillbilly pot fields. Also, the brown mountain lights in NC are pretty odd. Years ago, around a decade back, my friend and I were part of the same Marine Corps Reserve Unit. The distance to our unit from my place was a good two hours. One particular day, we were required to report early. To save time, we decided I'd stay at his place, situated halfway between my home and the drill center. After a night of barracks cuts and a couple of beers, my friend, looking a bit troubled, confided in me about an unusual problem with the house he was renting. He believed it was haunted by a ghost. I, being a skeptic, couldn't help but tease him. But his response was not what I expected. He looked straight into my eyes and uttered, It's a damn cat. He recounted incidents where he'd wake up to see the cat lounging outside his bedroom. Each time he would leap out of bed to catch it, but by the time he'd reached the doorway just five, seven feet away, it would vanish. 
I laughed it off, attributing it to his imagination, and decided to crash on the living room couch. The stillness of the night was interrupted when I felt something brushing against my hand, which dangled off the couch. As I peered down, I was met with the sight of a cat affectionately rubbing its head against my hand. Panic set in as I realized I was paralyzed the dreaded sleep paralysis. While my body was immobile, my willpower drove me to make a tiny movement. In a desperate attempt to prove its existence, I managed to grip the cat's face with my index finger, trying to nick my finger on its sharp tooth. Suddenly, the cat wrenched free and darted straight through the living room wall. The moment its tail disappeared, the paralysis lifted. Frantically, I inspected my finger. While there was no visible injury, I could faintly feel where the tooth had pressed against it, and there seemed to be a slight discoloration. The next day, still bewildered, I narrated the previous night's events to my friend. I may never know the truth of that night, but part of me is convinced I held on to a ghostly feline, even if just for a fleeting moment. The most uncanny thing, it behaved just like any ordinary cat. I've been a biologist ever since I was 22 years old. I grew up on a farm in rural Illinois, so nature has never been a stranger to me. Playing in the woods was how I entertained myself growing up. Spending all my time in a forest as a child, people expect me to have stories about Bigfoot or strange noises or finding some weird shrine out in the middle of the woods, but no. The weirdest thing I ever encountered was a bobcat screeching. It sounds just like a woman's dying scream, and yes, to everyone who's ever claimed to hear a skinwalker or goatman screeching in the woods at night, I promise you, it was just a bobcat. The truth is often mundane and disappointing. You'd think this would mean I'd have gotten bored of the woods, but I never really lost my love for them. Nature is boring. That's why I like it. You know what to expect. That's why, after college, I decided to make studying nature my full-time career. I'm a biologist for the Sierra Club, specialized in the ecosystems of Midwestern America. Fish, birds, deer, elk, bear, wolves, the like. I've spent weeks in fire towers, cabins, campsites, always miles away from civilization. I'm usually gathering data on local wildlife, measuring for pollutants, determining whether the ecosystem is stable or if anything threatens it. The work is not glamorous, but I enjoy it. And nature had still never surprised me. Until my last assignment. I was designated to be stationed alone in a cabin in the Ozarks. The assignment was supposed to last last three weeks in May. The Sierra Club was alerted to a steady decline in the local elk population over the last decade. Nothing drastic, but enough to raise concern. My job was to take census of the wildlife, measure for pollutants, the usual. These are my diary entries for my assignment, starting with my first night. I arrived in the evening in early May. Nothing was amiss the first two nights. It seemed an assignment like any other. The sounds of the forest were exactly what you'd expect. Crickets, an owl's hoot, and the occasional elk call. I was sent here in May because that's their mating season. The elk are out and about looking for, uh, dates, and that makes them easy to count. Elk mating is pretty straightforward. The female lets out a call and waits for a male to find her. Usually it's first come, first served, if you catch my drift. If only right, it was clear that love was in the air, and for all the calling, you'd think I would start seeing elk. But by the second day, I still hadn't spotted a single one. The third night, I was lying awake in bed uneasy. Something wasn't sitting right with me, but I couldn't put my finger on why. I was about to nod off when a female call cut through the night. I sighed. That was the second time that night I'd heard her. What, are the fellas having a guy's night in or something? And that's when it finally hit me. I shot bolt upright in bed. For the last three nights, I had heard nothing but female mating calls. That should have drawn every male within half a mile. Now elk are not discreet, and they don't beat around the bush. When that male gets to the female. Well, let's just that the whole forest will know about it. 
I sat in bed, staring out into the night, pondering. There have to be males close enough to hear this female. So after three nights of her calls, why haven't I heard the main event? The third day, I went out onto the trails, once again looking for some sign of elk in the forest. What I found was not encouraging. About a quarter mile from my cabin, I was trekking down the trail when I noticed something 30 feet into the woods. A large brown fuzzy mass lying in the brush. I smiled. An elk taking a midday nap. I took out my binoculars to get a closer look. It was an elk, all right. But my smile dropped when I realized that the brown fuzzy mass was completely still. I carry a hunting rifle with me for safety. I readied it and approached the elk carefully. It looked fine from where I was standing, but I nearly dropped my rifle when I rounded to the animal's front. It was carnage. The poor creature had been completely gutted. What little remained of its entrails hung loosely out of its chest cavity. The ribs had been pulled apart, and huge claw marks scarred its flank. Its head was barely connected to its body by a few weak strands of flesh. I heaved and almost lost what little breakfast I'd had. It was horrifying. I had to take a few moments to collect myself. This was the first time that nature had surprised me. What could have possibly done this? I've studied wildlife for years. This was a bull elk in its prime. It would have stood nine feet tall alive, a king of the forest. There is no predator on this continent that could have taken down a full-grown bull, pack or no pack. Even a grizzly wouldn't mess with something this big. And bears are mostly scavengers anyway. My mind raced through possibilities, trying to think of an explanation. Maybe it had been sick. Maybe a predator came upon it in its sleep, took it by surprise. Yes, that must be it. It couldn't have fought back. But this savagery, those claw marks were bigger than even a grizzly's. And its ribs. No quadruped could have exerted leverage on the ribs to split them like that. You would need arms. A chilling thought occurred. A human? Could humans have done this? But why? Hunters would skin it or take the head at least to mount on their wall. Is some psychopath out here dismembering wildlife for fun? And that still wouldn't explain those gruesome claws. Whatever this was, it needed to be reported. I was sent here to investigate the elk population declining, and this had to be related. I fished out my camera to take photos. Having to document the horror from every angle was heart-wrenching. The look in its eyes. This elk had been terrified when it died. I went to take one last shot. Just as the shutter clicked, my ears registered something. A sound from behind me that my camera had nearly drowned out. I whipped around. I had barely heard it, but it was there. A twig snapping. My camera hung from my neck and my rifle from my shoulder. I dropped the one to snatch up the other. Idiot, I thought to myself as I pointed the rifle towards the sound. I had been so shaken by the sight of the body I had completely overlooked one important fact. The kill was fresh. This corpse hadn't even begun to decay. This elk had been dead no more than half a day, and that means whatever killed it may still be nearby. With my rifle still trained on the spot, I backed away towards the trail. My hike back to the cabin was the only time in my life I felt scared of the forest. Trees surrounding me on all sides, no visibility. I jumped at the slightest sounds, never lowering my rifle, never going more than five seconds without looking behind me. I felt like prey, never knowing where the danger would come from or when. I didn't relax until my cabin door was closed and locked behind me. I spent the rest of my day inside the cabin shaken. I readied the photos and sent them to my supervisors. They would take a day or two to respond. Until then, my plan was to investigate. During the day, and with my rifle ready. That night was my last night at the cabin. I was getting ready for bed when I heard a female elk call again. The first one that I'd heard that day and close, very close. Wildlife don't like buildings. They smell of fire and metal and gasoline, all unnatural to them. They steer clear. What was this elk doing so close to my cabin? I peered out my window into the dark of the forest. No sign of her. 
She must have been beyond the tree line. I grabbed my rifle. Of course, I wasn't going to shoot the elk. But I might send a few shots into the air to scare her off. It would be nice to know the elk are breeding normally, but I could do without front row seats. I unlocked my cabin and took a step out onto my porch, rifle still in hand. My eyes scanned the tree line, looking for the female. That's when a pair of antlers struck out from behind a tree. An elk's head followed them and turned peer right out at me. But this was a buck, probably attracted by the female's calls. This was promising, but all the more reason to scare them away. I raised my rifle to the sky and prepared to fire. That was when the elk flew into the air, or its head did. The buck's head sailed in an arc towards me and landed just feet away from my door. I stood there in shock, trying to process what had just happened. Something. Something or someone had been holding the head, and had just thrown it. I nearly pissed myself in fear. I pointed my rifle at the tree where the buck's head had appeared. The light from my cabin barely reached. Were my eyes playing tricks on me? Had I just seen claws retreat around the trunk? I was frozen. I needed to reach behind me to open my door and get back inside but I was too scared to turn my back on the forest, or even take a hand off of my rifle. After a few seconds, I finally gathered up the nerve to brace the rifle against my shoulder, my finger still on the trigger. I groped behind me until my left hand found the doorknob, never taking my eyes off the tree. Thank God the door had not locked behind me. With my left hand, I turned the knob and pushed open the door, then drew it back to my rifle. I backed away quickly into the cabin, slamming the door and locking it. I hurried to the windows, drawing all my blinds and making sure each was locked, never letting my rifle out of arm's reach. The terror I felt as I approached each window, never knowing if there would be someone or something on the other side of the glass staring back at me. There hadn't been, which was almost as unnerving. I rushed to the satellite phone to call the sheriff's office at the base of the mountain. The relief I felt when they picked up. You need to get up here, I pleaded. Who is this? It was the sheriff's deputy on the other end. I'd met him and the sheriff before beginning my stay at the cabin. It's me. I'm the guy stationed up at the cabin on the mountain. Oh, sorry about that. What's the problem? There's someone up here messing with me. Get up here now. Whoa, whoa, slow down. You mean like kids or something? No, it is not kids. Someone up here just threw a decapitated elk head at my cabin. In my panic, I'd somehow kept the awareness to use the phrase, someone instead of something. I didn't want this guy to think I was drunk or crazy. I just needed him to get up here. Well, what did they look like? How many were there? Did they have guns? I have no idea, man. They killed a goddamn elk, cut the head off, and threw it at my cabin. Just get the hell up here. Oh shit, okay, okay, lock yourself in there. We're on our way. Man, please stay on the line, I'm scared here. I really was terrified. I wanted someone to stay on the phone with me, even if it couldn't help me. The man replied, I can't get to you and stay on the line at the same time. I'm calling the sheriff now, we're on our way. Just lock yourself in and stay there. The man hung up. I swore. I was alone again. A female elk call rang out again. This time it was even closer. It sounded like it was right outside now. I took up my rifle again. That's when the tapping started. While I was talking to the deputy, I hadn't been watching the windows. The sound was coming from the window to the right of my front door. My eyes widened in horror. A single gray claw was tapping on the right edge of the window. Just one claw. Whatever it was attached to wanted to stay out of sight. The claw stopped tapping. Instead, it drew itself along the window and out of my sight, leaving a long, ugly scratch. The sound was horrible. But it didn't stop when it left the window. I could still hear it, dragging along the wooden walls of my cabin. The creature was scratching through solid wood. Could it break through my windows? Why didn't it? My knees shook. I tracked the sound of the scratching with my rifle. My mind raced. Could this thing get in? How long until the sheriff showed up? I was high up on the mountain. 
The drive up here took 45 minutes. Even if they hurried, it might be a half hour. Even if they did get here, could they stop this thing? Should I make a run for my truck? No. Whatever that thing was, it could get to me before I got the truck up and running. Something nagged at the back of my head, but I could barely think. The scratching was louder and louder. Whatever this thing was, it had torn a bull elk to shreds. How could I stop it? The bull. That's when I realized it. The head. It was the same head as the bull I'd seen earlier. It had the same scar down its right cheek. This thing was taunting me. It must have been there when I found the dead elk. It had been watching me, and now it had thrown the head at me. Was it telling me to go away? To get out of its territory? I gasped. With my mind racing, I hadn't noticed that the scratching had stopped. Where was that thing? My eyes darted from window to window. No sign of it. Until the loud thud right above me. It's on the Gotham roof, I thought. Its footsteps echoed through my cabin. Between each step came rhythmic taps, no doubt from its claws. Was it testing for weaknesses? Was it merely toying with me? It had only been a few minutes since I called the sheriff's office. I was still far from safety. I hadn't moved since the call. The thing on my roof thudded from spot to spot. The shock was starting to wear off. Focus. Think. I told myself. The thing had probably seen me through my window. It was right above me. The bathroom. The bathroom was the safest spot. There were no windows. If it does break in, it will have to look for me, then break through the bathroom door. That might buy me an extra minute, and it might save my life. The creature knew where I was. I had to try to change that. I slowly slipped off my shoes. Keeping my rifle trained on the roof, I kicked a shoe towards my bed. Sure enough, the thuds on my roof followed, stopping right above the spot where my shoe had landed. It's tracking me. I slowly shuffled to the bathroom, not raising my feet, afraid to make a sound. Praying that the door would not creak, I opened the bathroom, preparing to lock myself inside. I was shutting myself in, hoping that I wouldn't die in this bathroom, when I heard a loud scratch, followed by a dull thud. It had jumped off the roof. It was on the ground again, outside the cabin. Why? Was it going away? I was afraid to hope that maybe it had gotten bored. Maybe it had found some other prey. That was when I heard the woman scream. I gasped and covered my mouth. How was that possible? No one else is up here. A hiker, a camper maybe. The scream came again. Help, she cried out. I gripped my rifle, crying now. I was frozen in fear. That thing was out there, chasing some poor woman, and I was too cowardly to help her. I just wanted to stay in that bathroom, hiding, hoping that every second the thing spent chasing that woman was another second closer to the sheriff getting here. I don't know how long I sat there, cowering. Another, more desperate scream. Help me. There was something in her terror. She was more scared than I was. And there I sat, letting her die. My shame overcame my fear. I gripped my rifle tighter and left the bathroom. I marched to the door, ready to face whatever this creature was. Maybe I could distract it. Buy time for her to get away. Maybe the sheriff would find her, even if the thing got me first. Just as I was reaching for the doorknob, she cried out again. A pained, dying scream. I was too late. That thing had gotten to her. I was a coward. And because of that, she was dead. The woman moaned in pain, this time just a few meters away from my door. This must be her final moments. And I listened, safe in my cabin. She groaned once more. But this sounded different somehow. It was. My eyes widened in shock and realization. I drew my hand from the doorknob as if it had burned me. I had never unlocked it. Thank God. The moan came again. This time, unmistakable. That was not a moan of pain or terror. It was an entirely different kind of moaning. I backed away from the door. You mother F, I muttered. You almost got me. It all made sense now. There never was any female elk. Mimicry is a common adaptation in all ecosystems both for prey and for predators. This thing, 
It let out female elk cries to draw in males. And then, well, I had already seen the result in the forest. That's why I never heard the elk mating. There was no female waiting for them. Only this monster. And now it was trying the same tactic on me. I nearly sobbed in terror. It had tried to lure me with the sound of a woman in distress. It thought that might draw me out. When that didn't work, it switched to its tried and true method. A mating call. I aimed my rifle at the door. The moans continued, louder and more intense, building into a climax. I was nauseous at the thought of whatever it was out there, squatting in the dark, mouth agape, emitting this perversion of a woman's voice, trying to draw me out into the dark and rip me apart just like that elk. I stood with my rifle trained at the door, not moving. I had resolved that I was going to stand there until the sun rose or until the sheriff came. And the moment I saw this thing, I was going to shoot it. I don't know how long I stood there among the echoes of that sick creature. Eventually, the moans puttered out and I was left in silence. Until the tapping began again. In the same spot as before. There it was. That single gray claw tapping on that same spot where it had scratched the glass. But then a second claw joined it. Then a third. It drummed them along the glass. Slowly. Ever so slowly. A patch of gray fur poked out from the edge of the window. Time stopped. And the creature brought its face into full view. It was. Terrible. Like. A sloth. But its mouth and nose were caked in blood. It had tiny, beady eyes front-facing. A predator's eyes. Large, pointed ears, almost like a bat. Thin, cracked lips. The monster looked right into my eyes. It cocked its head. And then, it pulled those terrible, bloody lips back into a smile. Its razor-sharp teeth, still stained with blood and flesh. I'll never forget them. It pointed that hideous grin at me as it drummed those claws on my window. Shoot, 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 I told myself. But I was frozen. This thing was going to kill me. Light poured through the front window. The monster disappeared out of sight. The sheriff and deputy had arrived in their truck. The two of them sauntered up to my porch and knocked. I had to shake myself out of my stupor and open the door. Both of them backed off and drew their weapons at me, screaming at me to put the gun down. I was still in shock. I think the only thing that kept them from shooting me was the terrified look in my eyes. They asked me what the hell was going on. I could barely speak. I just kept frantically repeating that they needed to get inside, that it was still out there. They eventually told me to come with them down to the sheriff's station. At first, I refused to leave the cabin. They sort of half dragged, half walked me to the truck. They said I was like an owl the whole ride down, my head on a swivel, always scanning the tree line for it. I must have fallen asleep after I got to the station. I woke up the next morning in a cell. I was confused and disoriented. I nearly wept from fear when I finally remembered everything I had been through the night before. The sheriff and deputy sat me down in a room and asked me what the hell happened that night. I was silent at first. I didn't know what to tell them. If I told the truth, they'd think I was crazy. They asked me about the elk's head that I'd told them about during the call. It was gone when they got there. Just a bloody stain on the ground where it had been lying. I made up a story. Said that some kids were prowling around my cabin, making noises, trying to scare me. I called the sheriff's office because I thought I saw one of them with a gun. The sheriff only made me go over the story once. He seemed satisfied. He took me back up there the next day to collect my stuff. In broad daylight, of course. Sure enough, there were deep scratch marks along the side of the cabin. The sheriff didn't look at me. Kids, he said. We collected my things quickly and hurried back down the mountain. I reported to my supervisors that it was probably overhunting causing the population decline. They would never believe the truth. The sheriff saw me off while I was waiting for the bus to take me back home. He shook my hand and drew me in for one of them manly half-hugs. He gripped my shoulder. Don't come back. He whispered. I gave him a confused look. He stared me right in the eyes. It knows you now. Has your scent. 
seen your face, heard your voice. You got away once. It won't happen again, so don't ever come back. That was years ago. I burned the clothes that I had worn that trip, so there's no way they'd end up near the Ozarks again. Never been back anywhere near the Ozarks. And anyone who's ever asked me, I always tell them to steer clear. I've spent so much time trying to forget what I saw that night. But that face, I remember every detail. It's kept me up so many nights with so many questions. What the hell was it? Some freak of nature, a mutant that somehow survived past infancy. Something supernatural. An alien? Those ears. Perfectly crafted to detect minute sounds just like a bat. That explains its mimicry. It grew up in that forest, hearing the elk calls. After a while it learned to copy them. I've spent so many nights asking myself, how? How did it know a woman's voice? I dread to ponder the answer. When sleep finally comes, I have nightmares. Nightmares about campers sitting around their fire, when all of a sudden they hear a voice calling out to them from the woods, crying for help. The voice in my nightmares calling them into the darkness of the trees away from the safety of their fire. The voice, my voice. One day last week a marvelous apparition was seen near Kenai Island. At the height of at least a thousand feet in the air, a strange object was in the act of flying toward the New Jersey coast. It was apparently a man with bat's wings and improved frog's legs. The face of the man could be distinctly seen, and it wore a cruel and determined expression. The movements made by the object closely resembled those of a frog in the act of swimming with his hind legs and flying with his front legs. Of course, no respectable frog has ever been known to conduct himself in precisely that way. But were a frog to wear bat's wings, and to attempt to swim and fly at the same time, he would correctly imitate the conduct of the Kenai Island monster. When we add that this monster waved his wings in answer to the whistle of a locomotive, and was of a deep black color, the alarming nature of the apparition can be imagined. The object was seen by many reputable persons, and they all agree that it was a man engaged in flying toward New Jersey. About a month ago, an object of precisely the same nature was seen in the air over St. Louis by a number of citizens who happen to be sober and are believed to be trustworthy. A little later, it was seen by various Kentucky persons as it flew across the state. In no instance has it been known to alight, and no one has seen it at a lower elevation than a thousand feet above the surface of the earth. It is without a doubt the most extraordinary and wonderful object that has ever been seen, and there should be no time lost in ascertaining its precise nature, habits, and probable mission. That this aerial apparition is a man fitted with practicable wings, there is no reason to doubt. Someone has solved the problem of aerial navigation by inventing wings with which a man can sustain himself in the air and direct his flight to any desired point. Who is this adventurous flyer and what is his object? Are questions of immediate and enormous importance. Of course, the first impulse of the unreflecting mind will be to exclaim that the mysterious flyer is an aeronaut who has invented practicable wings and is secretly experimenting with them before making his invention public. This is directly at variance with the known habits and customs of aeronauts. Had any aeronaut invented a pair of wings he would have advertised, long before his invention was perfected, that he was in possession of a machine wherewith to make an aerial voyage to Europe in 24 hours, and that he was prepared to exhibit it for a few weeks to everyone who would pay 50 cents to see it. A little later, he would have taken up a subscription to pay the expenses of his proposed voyage in the interests of science and would probably have published a book on the science of aeronautics. Then he would have suddenly disappeared, taking his wings with him or accidentally burning them, and after the first outburst of indignation on the part of a swindled public would have been totally forgotten. This has been the invariable practice of these ingenious aeronauts who have claimed to be the inventors of balloons or other apparatus capable of navigating the air. That the mysterious flying man has not followed this custom makes it perfectly clear that he is not a professional aeronaut. 
Beyond any question, either the flying man or some scientific person at present unknown has invented the bat's wings and frog's legs with which the flying man now sails through the air. Why has not the inventor patented his invention and had himself duly written up by the press? The reason is obvious. The flying man is engaged in some undertaking which he cannot safely proclaim. In other words, he is an aerial criminal, a fact which explains the cruelty and determination visible on his countenance. And what can be the nefarious object which this probable wretch has in view? It cannot be simply theft and robbery, for it would manifestly be impossible for him, in his flying costume, to perpetrate burglary or highway robbery, or to pick pockets. It cannot be plumbing for obvious reasons, neither can it be the sale of books published by subscription only. Yet the flying villain must have an object, and we have a right to assume that only a peculiarly nefarious object could induce a man to fly to New Jersey or St. Louis in hot weather, and without an umbrella or mosquito net. It has not escaped notice that of late Mr. Talmadge has been wandering in the West in search of entertaining varieties of crime wherewith to embellish his sermons. It is also known that he returned to this city just before the flying man of Kenai Island was seen. Now, if there is a man in this country whose arms and legs are fitted to endure the muscular strain inseparable from the act of flying, that man is Mr. Gazager Talmadge. He has preached for years with those graceful limbs, and must have developed and hardened their muscles to an extent which would fill every other professional acrobat with envy. What is more probable than that Mr. Talmadge has equipped himself with wings in order to study interesting types of immorality from the lofty height of a thousand feet. He has flown over St. Louis and Kentucky precisely the places which might be expected to yield a rich reward to an investigator of crime, and he is now flying to and fro over Kenai Island, preparatory to preaching a scathing sermon on the wickedness and indecencies of our bathing resorts. Here we have a natural and probable explanation of the flying man, and it is earnestly to be hoped that no one, with mistaken zeal for field sports, will attempt to shoot the preacher on the wing with a shotgun. There is not a shotgun in existence which will do any good at a distance of a thousand feet. When I had 16 years old, I was in my friend's house watching a movie, and after I come back to my house, walking on the street normally, was 1.30 a.m. when I arrival in my house, I gone to my room and go front the mirror. I didn't turn on the light in this moment, I used my phone's flashlight. So in this exactly moment I saw a pale man behind me, with straight black hair, looking at me for three five seconds and I could felt my skin creeps like never before in my whole life. I was so scarred with this, I couldn't sleep well in this night. I had overthinking in this thing for few years but couldn't found something about it. I don't, what is it? On September 18th, an unsettling incident unfolded involving my dad's friend and a terrifying creature known as the Dogman. This creature had brutally killed his 130 pound dog. The dog had a poignant backstory as it was a gift from his wife's late uncle. Before his passing, the uncle had entrusted her with the dog, and she had promised to care for it. One night, the dog's instincts kicked in, sensing a looming danger. They began barking incessantly, indicating a perceived threat. Despite their efforts, the dog managed to escape from their home. Tragically, the following morning revealed a grim sight. The lifeless body of the dog lay on their porch, its entrails savagely torn apart. In response, Justin, the dad's friend, moved the dog's remains to another location, intending to return later to bury it. However, upon his return, he was met with confusion and disbelief the dog's body had disappeared without a trace. Seeking answers, he reviewed the footage from his trail camera and was met with a chilling revelation the camera had captured images of the dogman itself. Unfortunately, I don't possess the actual pictures of the dogman. The incident left Justin's wife profoundly distraught grappling with the loss of their beloved pet and the unsettling encounter with the enigmatic dogman.
I have lived in Florida almost my entire life, and right now I live in Central Florida, so this is terrifying. When I was about eight, we rented a place that was on one of the main streets of our town. Without being too specific, this was in Pinellas County. My brother and I would walk our dog down the main road, and occasionally we would see a dead animal. We would just assume that it was roadkill from the night before. It was always opossums and raccoons, so this was the most logical conclusion. This went on for weeks, maybe months. As time went on, there were more and more dead animals, and we noticed they were always in one yard. As time went on, we noticed the animals got more and more exotic. For example, one time there was a dead snapping turtle. This would not have been roadkill in the area because there wasn't water around this specific area, and we had never seen this type of turtle nearby. So whoever lived there had been slowly collecting more dead animals as time went on. It was freaky shit, especially for an eight and six year old. We eventually told our parents and some other family, and my grandma brushed it off by saying that in her old neighborhood, people would nail dead animals to trees, so this wasn't a big deal. Still weird and oddly out in the open on this large road. It is still creepy to think that this was going on so close to home. And now, after your story, the feeling is back. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.